George Gallup and Sarah Jones were co-authors of a book called 100 Questions and Answers, colon, Religion in America. They said that nearly all United States adults say they believe in God or in a universal spirit. However, the gap is widening between believing and belonging. They learned that 84% believe that Christ is the Son of God. 80% believe in a last judgment. 80% believe in the miracles of the New Testament. That's up from 62% in 1982. 71% believe in life after death. 53% believe in a literal burning hell. And only 20% deny that there is a being called the devil. 77% believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. 44% believe in creationism. 70% believe that life has meaning. And 80% pray in the time of crisis. You hear that? 80% pray in the time of crisis and 64% admit to reading their Bible sometimes. In addition to that, there's a drop from 67% to 60% who believe in the ethics of clergymen in general. And the fault lay with the scandals of the televangelists, according to the book. Then they added, people tend to leave church in their late teens and return in their late 20s. They said that women are more likely to come back to the church than men, and black folk are more likely to come back to the church than white folk. Married people are more likely to go to church than singles. I just thought you would enjoy thinking on those things. Tonight, I want to tell you about two preachers. And I will suggest that there is a vital relationship between these statistics you've been listening to. This earth went through what was called the Dark Ages. A time when Bibles were confiscated and burned in public squares. Men and women by the multiplied thousands, yet millions, were forbidden by law to even read the Bible. I want to tell you that's why they were called dark ages. This Bible says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You take away the word of God and darkness comes. And it's not just spiritual darkness. You take away the word of God, scientific darkness comes. Medical darkness comes. Industrial darkness comes. All you got to do is think about history. For over 1,200 years, the world was lost in darkness. Darkness. Call the dark ages. And the Reformation, a return to the Bible, also brought the Renaissance and the Industrial Revolution. All scientific inventions worth talking about have come into being since the dark ages were removed. The word is the lamp. The word is a light. Take away the word of God and it doesn't take long for people to degenerate into paganism. I was out in a very beautiful section of California and... uh, They drove me down to a place where the water was so clear, it looked like you could drink it. A river that was moving slowly. It was really so beautiful and terribly hot. And I suggested we ought to go swimming. Someone said, no, you can't do that. This is where the hippies come to swim. And the fish have been pulled out of there with hepatitis. Throw away God's word, have no regard for the morals of God's word, and it doesn't take long to degenerate and to degrade our sins. And so, there was this long period of over 1,200 years 
when Bibles were burned in public squares and ridiculed and derided. And I want to tell you, the world has never recovered from that terrible tragedy. I don't believe the world will until Jesus comes and settles the issue. One of the things that came out of it was divided Christianity. As the Reformation churches began to develop, we found that one group said we believe this, another group said we believe that, and today in America, there are over 500 denominations, cults, and independent groups which all claim to worship one Jesus. Now, there's only one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Why are we so divided? Right here in this city, they have lots of beautiful churches. Some are across the street from one another. They do not believe the same thing. And the Bible says God wanted his people to be like-minded. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to say something I hope you will never forget. If all people who love God would go to the Bible and the Bible only, if they would put aside opinions, if they would put aside their theology, if they would put aside their pamphlets and their cassette tapes, if they would go to God's Word and God's Word only, the whole of Christianity would be united again, obeying one God, doing what God said. The reason we are divided is because... We have never recovered from Bibles being taken away for so long a time. Finally, with the Reformation, the Bibles were returned. I don't know if you have read all about this or not, but the dark ages ended, frankly, with the return of the Bible. Martin Luther, one of the great reformers, was carried and put away in a castle for safekeeping. He actually thought he was going to be killed. But when he got out there in the forest... In the castle of Duke Frederick of Saxony, Martin Luther began to realize he was being treated and preserved by God. And rather than just sit there, he decided to do something useful. And so he took the Latin and translated it back into the language of the common people. Now, I want to show you how providence works. Martin Luther finally had the Bible in a language the people could understand. And when he got his Bible ready, lo, another German by the name of John Gutenberg, had invented a print press. Now you don't have to copy it by hand. They began to run it off on the print press, and like leaves of autumn, the word of God was spread throughout Germany and throughout Europe, and when the light returned, the darkness was on its way out. Somebody ought to say amen. The word of God is a lamp. In 1810, the British Bible Society was formed. In 1815, the American Bible Society was formed. And since that time, you can get a free Bible. Every time I check into a hotel, there's a Bible in my room. I get on airplanes. They got Reader's Digest and all of these magazines. But if you have a mind to feast on the Word of God, there's a Bible on the airplane. Men and women are without excuse today, not knowing God's will. You can go to the library and read the Bible. Bibles are everywhere by the grace of God. But today, hats go to church, furs go to church, jewelry goes to church, fashions go to church, chewing gum goes to church. Cookies go to church, knives go to church, and even guns go to church. But there are two preachers that have almost quit. Who are they? I'm using a figure of speech, what you learned in school. It's called personification. It's something that's done in the Bible time and time again. You can read in the Bible where Abel's blood cried out. To God. Now, blood can't cry. This is personification. I can turn in my Bible and read to you where the trees clap their hands. That is personification. Now, who are these two preachers? And I have no desire to remain mysterious about it. In Revelation 11 and verse 3, they are the two witnesses of Revelation. 
The Bible prophesied concerning the dark ages and the great religious apostasy. And the Bible says these two witnesses would be shut up. In other words, they wouldn't be going to church and spreading light. Who are they? They are the Testament brothers. Old and new. These are the two preachers that have almost quit going to church. You can hear civil rights. You can hear philosophy. You can hear politics. You can hear almost everything except the word of God. Let me tell you, these brothers are very close. Men have tried to drive a wedge between them. Men have tried to separate them and create some kind of dichotomy between them. Men have tried to turn these Testament brothers against each other, but old and new have never had a disagreement. Would you say amen out there? Now, old is a lot older and larger than new. In fact, old lived for centuries apart from new, and yet they are in complete accord and complete concord. New says this about old. Second Timothy 3 and verse 16. All Scripture. How much? All, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It is profitable for doctrine, profitable for reproof, profitable for correction and instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be perfect. And the Bible says all Scripture, not some little section of the Bible, not some little dispensational section, but all scripture. And when Jesus was here, old was all by himself. There was no New Testament. And yet one scholar sat down and traced every word that they say Jesus said that's written in red in a lot of Bibles. And he came up with this statistic. He said that 10% of everything Jesus said was a direct quotation from the Old Testament. In other words, Jesus was a Bible preacher. And you can trust a Bible preacher. Jesus said in John 5, 39, search the Scripture. Now listen to me. When he said that, there was no New Testament. The New Testament didn't come for some 20 years after Christ had gone back to heaven. Mark, it is believed, wrote the first book. So when Jesus said, search the scriptures, he was only talking about the Old Testament because that's all they had. Now let me finish the quotation. John 5.39 says, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me. Jesus said, you can find me in the scriptures, you can find me in the Old Testament. I'm not some creation of the New Testament. I am God. I am the Word. I was here from the beginning. And in the Old Testament, you can find things which point to me. If you read a little further in that chapter, verses 46 and 47, Jesus said, if you had believed Moses, if you believed whom? If you had believed Moses, you would have believed me. For he wrote of me. But if you don't believe him, how can you believe me? John 5, 46 and 47. When Jesus was on the road to Emmaus with those discouraged disciples, they didn't even know who he was. They were so depressed. And they finally got inside and sat down together. And the Bible says that Jesus began with Moses and all the prophets and told them what the scriptures said about himself. Jesus started with Moses, and you can't go back further than that, for Moses wrote wrote the book of Genesis. Ladies and gentlemen, that is found in Luke 24, 27, and 44. Beginning with Moses, he expounded unto them the things which the scripture said concerning himself. And when he held his hands up 
and they saw the nail prints, they knew him. In Luke 4 and verse 16, the Bible says that Jesus came to Nazareth as his custom was, went into church on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. What did he read? He read from Isaiah chapter 42. I hope tonight you settle it in your mind that there is harmony in the word of God. The Bible does not fight itself. It was inspired by one Holy Ghost. It was given by one Jesus Christ. Why would there be contradictions when one Holy Ghost said it? If there appear to be contradictions, the problem is not with the Bible, but with misunderstanding and being mistaught. You see, when a man tells you something that the Bible doesn't say and then reads something that it does say, he's got a contradiction. So rather than say I was wrong, he said the Bible contradicted itself. Oh no, the Bible is one harmonious whole, written over a period of more than 1,500 years. There are some who say if you read the Old Testament, all you can read about is works. And if you read the New Testament, all you can read about is grace. What? As soon as man sinned, Genesis chapter 3, as soon as man sinned, God came down and killed two lambs. He killed two lambs to demonstrate to them that one day the Lamb of God will come and pay your debt. That's grace. Who said there's no grace in the Old Testament? As soon as man sinned, God gave him a way out of his dilemma. In Genesis 6, 8, the Bible says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Were it not so, the whole human race would have been cut off in the flood. Isaiah chapter 9, one of my favorites. Isaiah was called the gospel prophet. He wrote so much about Jesus. But in Isaiah chapter 9, he said, Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. You know, I love that. My people were slaves in this country. And for a long time, we didn't have a proportionate share of the wealth and prosperity of America. And many people who have not overcome their racism tend to look down on my people. Let me tell you, when God said unto us, a child is born, he was talking about me. Did you know that? Unto us, who have so little of this world's goods. Unto us, disfranchised from coast to coast. Unto us, the last higher than the first fire. Unto us is born this day in the city of David. Then he said, unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called Wonder. Oh, Jesus is wonderful. One day Jesus had 5,000 men in front of him, and they were so hungry, they began to keel over and faint. Jesus said to his disciples, we got to feed these people. One of the disciples said, we don't have that kind of money. It would take 200 penny worth of bread to feed all his people. Jesus said, let's give them something to eat. And a little boy came forward with a lunch. Now, I don't know if you've ever read the menu, but he had three little fishes and five loaves of bread. And I'm one of these country boys with a good appetite. I could have eaten the whole thing by myself. But he brought it to Jesus. And Jesus something to it that mama couldn't add to it in the kitchen and he started breaking it and they fed 5,000 men plus women and children and took up 12 baskets full from those who didn't join the clean plate club that's wonderful one day Jesus saw a funeral coming his heart was touched there was a widow walking by the bed of her own son and her heart was broken Jesus walked out in the middle of the parade and stopped the funeral And he went up to that mother, and he opened up the casket, and he said, son, come alive. And he came alive. That's wonderful. No wonder the people turned against him. The folk who owned the grocery stores didn't like him because he was going around feeding people free of child. Doctors didn't like him because he was taking that client list and healing them free of child. And now the grocers didn't like him because of the same thing, and the funeral directors didn't like him. 
interrupted and they had to give refunds. He wound up. One day he saw his disciples out on the sea, toiling fruitlessly, discouraged, and Jesus needed to get out there. And there was no canoe, there was no boat, there was no bridge. So disdaining the inconvenience, Jesus just walked on the water. That's wonderful. It means that wherever you are, he can get to you. Why? Because he's wonderful. Who said there's no grace in the Old Testament? Abraham was at Mount Moriah about to kill his own son. And God didn't stop him until he had built the altar. Tied up his boy and placed him on there. God will test you sometime. He'll see how far he can go with you sometime. God just kept watching. And finally Abraham went in his night. God still didn't stop. But when he raised his hand in the air, God did. You see, before your hand can move, your brain has to tell it to move. My brain tells my arm to go up and it'll stay there till my brain tells it to come down. And so a decision had to be made. And when that man made the decision that he wouldn't even spare his own son in obedience to God, that brain told the arm to come down and plunge the knife into the heart of his son. And at that moment when he decided, he heard a voice saying, Abraham, Abraham, don't kill the boy. Look in the thicket. There's a ram there. Take the ram. That's grace. Who said there's no grace in the Old Testament? Then who said there's no wrath in the new? No work in the new. I can preach God's commandments entirely from the New Testament. John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Matthew 5, 17 to 19, he said, I didn't come to change the law, but to fulfill it. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least commandments and teach men so, the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. That's the New Testament. Then you're going over to to 1 John 3, 4, and the Bible says, Whoso committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. That's works in the New Testament. James 2, 10, New Testament says, If you keep the whole law and break one, you're guilty of all. Revelation 22, 14. Now, if you ever think about it, that's as far as you can go in the New Testament. Revelation is the last book, and chapter 22 is the last chapter. That's the end of the Bible. Revelation 22, 14 says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. Somebody ought to say amen to that. Who said there's no works? In the New Testament. And there are those who say, well, there's no love in the old. It's amazing what men say. Sometimes I wonder what Bible they're reading. There's no love in the Old Testament. Why, in the Old Testament, one of the most poignant love stories you'll ever read is found. There was a prophet whose name was Hosea. What was his name? God told that young man to go and take a wife of four numbers. Wow. God said, I want you to marry a prostitute. Now, I can imagine Hosea had come up on the right side of the tracks. Hosea had a good family background. Perhaps as a seminarian, he had been thinking about a certain young lady, a virgin, if you please, a good girl that he wanted to walk with him through his ministry. And now comes the word of the Lord. And God said to him, I want you to take a wife, a prostitute for a wife. Finally, in obedience, he went and married this woman. And he led her out of the red light district. Led her, led her on over to where the, the elite lived. Took her over where the decent people had their community. And I can guarantee you, when he married her, tongues were flying. They were whispering and gossiping everywhere they heard about it. My child, did you hear about that preacher that married that prostitute? And he took a home, and she bore him children. Read it, it's in there. And after a while, that woman turned wild again. She decided to revert to her old trade in the flesh. She left that man, as good as he was to her. Gave her his name, gave her his home, had children with her. 
fed her, took care of her, took her about with him proudly on his arm. Now, like some do even today, she turned her back on a good husband, went back over into the red light district, started in her trade again. And his heart was broken. You can believe that. Read it in there. He told his children, go find your mother and tell her to come home. I still love her. And one day, word came that she had fallen on hard times again and was going to be sold at auction. Now, if Hosea was anything like me, he would have said, good. You know how we are after after all I did for her. She made her bed hot, let her lie in it. You know that's the way we are. Good. That's what she deserved. Now, I imagine he was tempted with that. But while he's thinking about it, the voice of the Lord came. The voice of the Lord said, Hosea, I want you to go down to the auction. And when they put her on the auction block, I want you to start bidding. Nobody must outbid you. So take plenty of money with you. And this man was obedient to the word of God. And he went down. And they brought this woman out in her shame, her dress probably dirty and tattered, her head bowed, her hair hanging over her face. And all of a sudden, they started to bid, and she heard a familiar voice. And every time somebody would raise the ante, he went a little higher. And she finally looked out through her hair, and she saw her husband standing out there. And he kept on bidding until the auctioneer said, going once going twice, sold to that preacher over there. And Hosea walked up there and got that shameful woman by the hand. Now, did she deserve this? Oh, no, 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 no. He went up there and got her by the hand, spoke gently in her ear, led her tenderly down the steps, and started again toward home. And God said to Hosea, I want you to tell Israel that that's the way Tell them to turn on backsliding children, for I am married unto you. I will heal your backsliding. I will take you back again. I thank God tonight. He takes people back again. Love. That's the Old Testament we're talking about. Love. Like as a father pitieth his children, says the Old Testament. Psalm 103 and verse 17. So the Lord pitieth them that fear him. And then in Isaiah 49, 15, the Bible says, Can a mother forget her suckling child? Yes, she may forget. Yet I'll not forget you. And all of a sudden I have learned that mothers will destroy their children. Drive them into a lake and drown them. Jesus said, A mother might turn against her children, but I'll not turn against you. Love in the Old Testament. Who says there's no wrath in the New? One of the most dreadful chapters you can read in all the Bible is Revelation chapter 16. There the Lord gives a revelation of the seven last plagues that are coming upon those who are willfully impenitent and who receive the mark of the beast. And if you start off, it starts with a noise and grievous sore. Men break out with blames and boils, and they are running, and they're festering, and they're aching, and they stink. And you call the doctor. He can't help you. He's got it, too. This is the first of the seven last plague. Then while they are burning with fever, they go to their faucets and turn them on to get some water. Their bodies are crying out for, and blood runs out of the faucet. This is wrath. And I'm not going through all of them tonight. Might preach about them before we finish out here. Wrath. God's anger against those who continue to rebel against his authority. Wrath in the New Testament. Revelation 20 and verse 9 says, The devil leads the wicked up to the holy city. Where did it come from? Revelation 21 says, I, John, saw the holy city. New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. 
The Bible even tells us where it's going to land. It says the Mount of Olives will split in two and level off and become a plain. And the holy city will come down to the very place where Jesus ascended from. There it is in all of its splendor. Its walls of jasper standing 57 feet high. And you can see through them just like you can see through eyeglasses. And the wicked are raised in the second resurrection. And the devil marshals them together. And they go up to try to take the city. And the Bible says in Revelation 20 and verse 9, Fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. That's hell. All this foolishness about hell burning now. I'll talk to you about it before I'm through. Hell is going to burn in the future. You ask people, where is hell? Down yonder. What do you mean down yonder? Well, down yonder. People have dug into the earth. They have found sand, rock, and granite, and coal, and diamond, and gold, silver, and platinum, and copper. They found everything except him. These fairy tales that are preached do not hold true. Somebody ought to say amen to that. When is hell going to burn? It will burn after the millennium, after the second resurrection, when the wicked try to take God's city. The Bible says fire comes down from God out of heaven. In the New Testament, the Bible is one whole. There is no problem between these brothers. There is no disagreement. We should not even try to create such a thing. In the Old Testament, looking forward to Jesus, he was called Shiloh. He was called the great I Am. In the Old Testament, he's called the seed of David. In the Old Testament, he's called our high priest. In the Old Testament, he is called the Lord, our righteousness. But in the New Testament, he's called something else. He's called the door. He's called the way. He's called Jesus. He's called the Lamb of God. He's called the true vine. But they all are referring to the same Christ. One day, John was placed on the Isle of Patmos. John was the only disciple that had not been done away with. Tradition says they put him in a pot of boiling oil, but he was miraculously saved by God. And when they brought him out of that oil and he wasn't dead, they had to hide him away lest people worship him. So they put him in prison on that. Hard labor the rest of his life. They told him you got to work every day. But there was one day John didn't work. That was the Sabbath day. And he found a cave and was on the backside of the island. And Jesus came down, gave him a revelation. The Bible says that Jesus came and John fell at his feet. And he began to describe Jesus. And I can imagine John saying, look, Jesus, you told us disciples to carry the gospel into all the world. Now, brother Peter has been crucified at Rome. Brother Paul had his head chopped off at Rome. Andrew and Bartholomew were slain in India, skinned alive. And one after another, they all are dead. I'm the only one left. And you told me to go into all the world. And I'm in prison out here. I'm the last one. And Jesus said, my friend John, you got that a ways wrong. You're not the last one. I am Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning and the end. And as long as I live, the church has somebody to lean on. Somebody to lead them. Oh, my friends, Bible tells us in Micah 5, and this is amazing to me, in the book of Micah chapter 5, Old Testament even told us where Jesus would be born. Start reading verse 2 and read the verse 7. And it says, but thou, now don't miss this, and I'm going to end with this. It says, but thou, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Here, hundreds of years before Jesus would be born, the Old Testament names a town. Now, there are a lot of towns called Bethlehem. I know of three in the United States. I live, or used to live near one in Pennsylvania. Bethlehem. Steel. You heard of Bethlehem Steel. They made steel up there. So, here is the prophet 
saying, but thou, O Bethlehem, and let's dismiss, mix it up with another Bethlehem. He said, Bethlehem, Ephrathah. What does that mean? O Bethlehem of Ephraim. That's like saying Phoenix, Arizona. Very specific. The prophet said, but thou, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little amongst the provinces of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth. Now, that's what you call sticking your neck out. I'm glad I serve a God. When he speaks, it comes to pass. What do you say, church? The prophet named Bethlehem. Now, I was over there, and I began to ask questions. I wanted to know, how far is Bethlehem from Nazareth? And my guide said, at least 75 miles as the crow flies. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to get the picture. Hundreds of years before Jesus was born, the Old Testament named the town Bethlehem of Ephraim. Now, if I were God, the safest thing to do would be to find a virgin in Bethlehem. Huh? But he didn't. He found one in Nazareth. 75 miles away. Now, it seems to me that God would have said, since I have chosen a virgin way up here, I better get her and her husband down there, let them get themselves an apartment so they can be there as the baby comes. Wait until she was nine months pregnant. I want you to get this. If Joseph and Mary had not ended up in Bethlehem, the Bible would have been a lie. Because the prophet had named Bethlehem. He didn't name Nazareth. So they got to get down there. Now they wait until a baby is due at any time. What could make a man in his right mind travel at least 75 miles on a donkey with a pregnant wife? They didn't have any ambulances. They didn't have any helicopters. What kind of man would do that? And you know you hear it every Christmas in Luke chapter 2. And they went forth a decree from Caesar Augustus. A decree. Let me call it an imperial decree. And when the emperor gave a decree, you didn't have any option. Augusta didn't care a thing about women, especially Jewish women. What did he care that that woman was pregnant? He gave a decree, and Joseph had to go or die. So he sat on his donkey, and he padded it well, and he put his wife on that donkey, and he started out. And he had to travel slowly. He had to stop often to let her rest. And while he is traveling slowly and stopping, everybody else is rushing back. And when he finally got there, after perhaps several days, there was no room in the end. And you told me to go into all the world, and I'm in prison out here. I'm the last one. And Jesus said, my friend John, you got that a ways wrong. You're not the last one. I am Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning and the end. And as long as I live, the church has somebody to lean on. Somebody to lead them. Oh, my friends, Bible tells us in Micah 5, and this is amazing to me, in the book of Micah chapter 5, Old Testament even told us where Jesus would be born. Start reading verse 2 and read the verse 7. And it says, but thou, now don't miss this, and I'm going to end with this. It says, but thou, O Bethlehem, Ephraim. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Here, hundreds of years before Jesus would be born, the Old Testament names a town. Now, there are a lot of towns called Bethlehem. I know of three in the United States. I live, I used to live near one in Pennsylvania. Bethlehem. Steel. You heard of Bethlehem Steel. They made steel up there. So, here is the prophet saying, but thou, O Bethlehem, and let's mix, mix it up with another Bethlehem. He said, Bethlehem Ephrathah. What does that mean? 
oh, Bethlehem of Ephraim. That's like saying Phoenix, Arizona. Very specific. The prophet said, but thou, O Bethlehem, Ephraim, though thou be little amongst the provinces of Judah, yet out of thee shall it come forth. Now, that's what you call sticking your neck out. I'm glad I serve a God. When he speaks, it comes to pass. What do you say, church? The prophet named Bethlehem. Now, I was over there, and I began to ask questions. I wanted to know how far is Bethlehem from Nazareth. And my guide said, at least 75 miles as the crow flies. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to get the picture. Hundreds of years before Jesus was born, the Old Testament named the town Bethlehem of Ephraim. Now, if I were God, the safest thing to do would be to find a virgin in Bethlehem. Huh? But he didn't. He found one in Nazareth. 75 miles away. Now, it seems to me that God would have said, since I have chosen a virgin way up here, I better get her and her husband down there, let them get themselves an apartment so they can be there as the baby comes. Wait until she was nine months pregnant. I want you to get this. If Joseph and Mary had not ended up in Bethlehem, the Bible would have been a lie. Because the prophet had named Bethlehem. He didn't name Nazareth. So they got to get down there. Now they wait until a baby is due at any time. What could make a man in his right mind travel at least 75 miles on a donkey with a pregnant wife? They didn't have any ambulances. They didn't have any helicopters. What kind of man would do that? And you know you hear it every Christmas in Luke chapter 2. And they went forth a decree from Caesar Augustus. A decree. Let me call it an imperial decree. And when the emperor gave a decree, you didn't have any option. Augusta didn't care a thing about women, especially Jewish women. What did he care? that that woman was pregnant. He gave a decree, and Joseph had to go or die. So he saddled his donkey, and he padded it well, and he put his wife on that donkey, and he started out. And he had to travel slowly. His wife's pregnant. He had to stop often to let her rest. And while he is traveling slowly and stopping, everybody else is rushing back. And when he finally got there, after perhaps several days, there was no room in the inn. And you know the Christmas story. Finally, somebody offered a stable, and away in a manger, no crib for a bed, the little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet head, but he did it in Bethlehem. Why don't you say man? Now, I read... Uh, about a compound law of probability. And according to the compound law of probability, the chance of that coming true by accident would be one chance in one with a hundred ciphers behind it. Now, if you take a one and put three ciphers behind it, you got a thousand. Three more, you got a million. Three more, you got a billion. Three more, you got a trillion. Three more, you got a quadrillion. Three more, you got a quintillion. Three more, you got a sextillion. Three more, you got a septillion. Three more, you got an octillion. Three more, you got a nonillion. Three more, you got a decillion. And that's only 30 zero. In other words, according to the law of compound probability, the chance of this prophecy coming true by accident was impossible. Would you say amen? The Old Testament pointing to Jesus. The Old Testament being dependable and accurate. The Old Testament coming true. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. 
There is no problem between them. These Testament brothers ought to go to church more. If men would study this and read from this and base their religion on this rather than creeds and opinions and philosophies, the church of Jesus Christ would worship on the Sabbath together. Because that's the only one in here. The church of Jesus Christ would worship the same way on the same day. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. And now let us close with some things on the screen. Ladies and gentlemen, the Testament brothers, the two preachers, read one little text and close the Bible. When what we need is an exposition of the Word of God. The Bible says, search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. And this is, uh, pardon me, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's what the word of God can do. It can get to you. It can speak to you. It will expose you. And then it will point you to Jesus. It will comfort you. And it will give you hope. The word of God. Ladies and gentlemen, these young men went into a fiery furnace rather than disobey the word of God. Nebuchadnezzar said, didn't we cast in three? And lo, I see four. Then there was Daniel. Went into a lion's den rather than disobey the word of God. And an angel came and locked the lion's jaw. Those lions were hungry. You know how I know? Because the Bible says once they got Daniel out, they threw the guys in there who had lied on him, and they ate everything, including their bones. And then there was a whale that had to obey the word of God. That whale sucked old Jonah down a tube, gave him a ride for three days, and finally God spoke to that whale. And that whale had to do what God said. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, what a mighty God we serve, and what a mighty word there is for our admonition. And after that, we look at the word raising the dead. One day, Jesus walked over to a tomb where one of his best friends was, and he said, Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth. Jesus didn't even go down in there. He just gave three little words, and the word went down in there and the words got mixed up in the animate clay and Lazarus came alive by the word of God oh it's quick and powerful and then we think that it opened the eyes of the blind old blind Bartimaeus said Lord have mercy on me he said what do you want me to do he said I want my sight and Jesus touched him and he became a seeing man again the word of God Heal the sick. One lady said, all you got to do is speak the word. Speak the word. Jesus' word is powerful. Quick and powerful. Then one day he was out on the sea with his disciples. And a storm came up. One of those storms that the devil brewed. And it was so severe, his disciples were trying their best. After all, they were sailors. They figured we can handle this thing. But it got so much worse, the water began to come in, and they wouldn't shook Jesus who was asleep. Master, carest thou not that we perish? How can you lie asleep when each moment so badly is threatening a grave in the angry deep? And Jesus stood up, and he looked out into the eye of a hurricane, held up those powerful hands, and the, the translator said, he didn't say, peace be still. He said, shut up. And the winds and the waves obeyed his word. The word of God is quick and powerful. It can straighten out our confused minds. And if we let it, it'll straighten out our upset homes. It'll settle your nerves. It'll let you sleep like a baby. The word of God, I say, can command devils. 
the demoniacs of Gadara came running out of the mountains as though they would tear Jesus apart. The disciples saw him coming and took off. And when they realized Jesus didn't run, they got embarrassed. And they wanted to go back. But when the devil ran up in the presence of Jesus, he came to a screeching halt. If I'm standing with Jesus, the devil can't do me any harm. Now, he's powerful, but I ain't scared of him. And that ain't self-confidence. That's confidence in Jesus. I hide behind Jesus. <laughs> Glory to God. He told the devils, get out of that man. And they had to get. Oh, I love his word. Word of God reveals only the truth. Only. That's why we bring that one book up here. We have many spiritual propositions, and we prove them with the Bible. You don't hear me quote Mahatma Gandhi and all these other good people. I quote the word of God. And if we did that, you discover that truth can be found. For the Holy Ghost will come and help you to discover it. Jesus said in John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. Sanctify means to make holy. How is God going to produce a people that are different than the run of the mill? How? Through the word, through adherence to the word, through listening to the word, through reading the word, through believing the word, through doing the word. Bible says, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? Now everybody's got faith of one kind or another. Some folks just have faith in themselves. And that's a sorry place to put your faith. But you got to have faith in the right thing. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You've got to believe what Jesus says. Got to be born of the Spirit by the word, he said to Nicodemus. And when that happens, the word of God becomes intrinsic, integral. It's a part of our makeup. It's a part of the mind and the mouth and the nose and the eyes and the ears. The word of God controls the whole mind. God cannot be separated from the believer. The word of God is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It, you don't have an excuse for being in darkness. If you don't know what to do and don't know what to believe, study the word. And if you don't know how to do that, come and hear it. Just make sure the man that's delivering is giving you the word and not his opinion. That's what you got to do. Listen, Jesus is coming soon. And we're nowhere near ready. And it's not his fault that we don't study the Bible. Not his fault that we don't read it. Not his fault that we are skeptical and unbelieving and all of that stuff. Jesus wants us saved. And he will use his word. Do you love the word tonight if you do say amen? Now, wait a minute. Wait. A minute. I don't think you understand what I'm saying. You're going to hear things from the word that you never heard before. Never understood before. Some of you heard it last night. But I want to ask you, what was given last night? Did it come from the Word? Now, you sure you love the Word? Somebody said to me one time, I wish I hadn't come to your meeting. Hadn't learned these things. You're still responsible to ask me that question. I'll answer it for you. Still responsible if you don't come. But Jesus wants us to be students of the Word, born of the Spirit, by the Word. I love God's Word. I want my faith based on His Word, not on some denominational idea. I don't even preach denominationalism. I preach the Word. And if I tell you and the Word doesn't say it, you don't have to believe it. If I tell you and it's not in here, then I'm a liar. And if I were you, I wouldn't come back. Now, how much fairer can I be? You are to check on me by the Word. You love the word? You want to be obedient to the word? You want to know more of the word? Then I appeal to you to stand on your feet and give evidence to heaven that you sincerely want that. Lord Jesus, it is written that you are the word. That the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Oh, blessed word of God. We come to you tonight 
wanting to be filled with the Word, fed by the Word, guided by the Word, saved by the Word. That's why we're standing here, Lord. Please have mercy on every one of us, the children as well as the adults. Lord, as we learn these things, let us not be, as was said in the parable, that the Word fell on stony ground, that the sun scorched it, or it fell where there wasn't much earth and it took no root. For it fell amongst thorns and was choked out. The thorns of worldliness and foolishness and pleasure. Oh, my Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that the word that is disseminated here will fall on good ground and spring up and bear fruit in the lives of these whom you love. Have mercy upon us. That is, there is someone who cares. He sends his word to you. There is someone who cares, and his word is always true. There is someone who cares. He'll guide you safely through. For that someone who cares is Jesus. There is someone who cares. His truth will set you free. There is someone who cares. And both his testaments are great. There is someone who cares. They are life for you and me. For that someone who cares is Jesus. And now may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon thee and give you peace. I pray that you'll have a good and safe night, that you'll sleep well, and have a good day tomorrow. But tomorrow night, don't let anything keep you from hearing an encouraging message from the Bible. Our title is, Is Humanity Hopeless? Can we really live above sin? Oh, precious Lord, Bring us back for that. And let us meet with thee tomorrow night. For Jesus' sake, let everybody say amen.